forte and uh, had not seen each other really since. And, and they well, you know, I ran into Margaret O'Brien, who I hadn't seen since I did a play with, yeah, and yeah. Anne Blythe, who I haven't seen in a long yeah, while, yeah. and you know, Alexis and Craig, you know. I mean, you just go on and on yeah, and on. Yeah. I mean, it was really fun. Well, great. You know, I love this new picture. I think I think it's Armin's best picture. Well, really he's, he's only done two, hasn't he? Or has he done he's more? done um, he's done two theatricals and two that went to video. Okay. And he has one uh, that uh, hasn't been released yet called Double Revenge, which is a uh, western. Oh, really? uh, it's supposed to be quite good. I have not seen that yet. Did he do that for Smart Egg? Yes. Luigi? Yes. Just have one Are we all set? There. Perfect. All right. Yeah, just like that. Are we okay, Ara? I like Luigi. Have you met him? I've talked to him on the phone. He's yeah, very nice. That's a good great. company. I it see is. they're going to go far. I really, really feel that. Yeah, well, you know, I think they can, they don't have to, I don't think, go at, go to, you know, they have a good arrangement with the bank, I think, in Europe, so it's the usual uh, thing. I have a project now financing. we're just trying to acquire that I'm so excited about, and it would be something they could just kick the hell out of. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I just, I just, the material was just sent to me, and I couldn't put it down. You know, it's really. Great. This is going to be fun. <clears throat> okay. Um. Cameron's Closet is a new picture from SVS Films, and to have your uh, in the picture is Owen Lansing. And that was mm -hmm. it's a terrific uh, thriller, kind of in the kind of horror vein. I was wondering what what attracted you to the material. Well, number one, I like the script. You know, when when I read the script, I then met uh, Luigi, the producer, and uh, Armand, the director. Oh, I'm sorry, one that, second. That, Let me that just check the mic. I, mean, I really I like what they had to say about it. Well, excuse me, we were just one. Oh, okay. Right We take two. He's from New York, isn't he? He's Armand Yeld is in Staten Island. Um, and, you know, Chris Cross's works, uh, he's actually done most of his pictures in L.A. Okay, hold on. But, you know, he works, he works like like a director in the days of live TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to have to take it from the top. <coughs> um, Cameron's Closet is a new uh, horror thriller from SVS Films, and Tab Hunter, you're in the film as Owen Lansing. Uh, it's a terrific horror thriller. I was wondering what attracted you to the material in the, in the first place. Well, my agent sent me out to meet with uh, the producer and director, and uh, number one, I really enjoyed meeting them. Then they gave me the script to read, and I thought, oh, I think they're putting together a nice family unit here. I'd like to be a part of it. And uh, I was very pleased when they called me and asked me to play this role. That was interesting, the, the scene in the closet, uh, the, uh, it's a, it seemed a very physically and emotionally challenging kind of a part. It's, uh, it's a man that really is poisoning his son's mind and, and uh, taking this pure innocent mind and just is creating a monster. And he's guilty of, you know, treading in areas that he shouldn't be. And uh, I, I loved what, uh, what it had to offer. I thought it would be great fun to play because you get very involved with this, but also you can have a, a good time with it, you know. You can relish it. It's, it's, those are delicious little rolls, you know, <laughs> moments that are really nice to savor. <laughs> now, Armand Mastriani, the director, that's a, a big step up for him from some of the low-budget things he's been doing. Uh, he, he, does he run a very relaxed uh, set? It, Armand knows what he wants. He's wonderful with actors. Most of your directors are traffic cops. Armand knows, and he plants wonderful seeds with the actor, and then allows you to cultivate them, and then will take you in the direction that he wants you. I like that. He works a lot like my favorite director, who is Sidney Lumet. He and did, of course, uh, I'm I'm crazy about Sidney's work. He did a picture of that kind of woman. Uh, yes. He's my number one favorite. He and Lucino Visconti are the two. What are those kind of qualities that uh, you, you know you'd like to find in a director that, that maybe uh, an, an actor's director, someone who's more sensitive to the actor's needs? Sensitive to the actor's needs is major, and also uh, giving you that confidence. I think somebody must be very secure, and he has a. They give you a security. It's really nice. Uh, you allow the freedom, but they're supportive of what you're doing, and I think that's very important. I don't think you ever get anything by tearing down. I think you get your best work by building up. And a good director to me is one who builds, builds that character through you, you know, and it, so you can work together. I like that. On a picture like you Cameron's Closet, uh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say you don't always get that. Most of the people are just concerned with get the words out, go on, let's get the next setup. How many setups are we going to get today? And that's just not motion picture making. Well, in Cameron's Closet, uh, I guess really any, most film schedules are, are grueling and long hours and so forth. 
Um, I, I know Armand likes to kind of maintain a, a nice kind of uh, atmosphere on the set, even though it's long hours and hard work. Well, was a, there were very long hours, but it was a very... I, I use this all the time about a family. You put together a family of people, you know, the, all, the cast and crew, they were a family, and that's how it should be. I like that unit. I like that independent. I like the independent production because of that. If you don't feel pressured, no one can do their best work under good, under pressure. You must be relaxed for it. Now you were groomed uh, in the uh, in the studio system at Warner Brothers, uh, which was a factory uh, <laughs> well, kind of situation, which is just the antithesis of what you're. That's about. dead. Yeah. But at least they took the time, yeah. and you worked with all kinds of people. You know. Uh, I like the studio system in many ways. It was very shielding and protective in some ways, which is good and bad. But it also, uh, the people that ran those studios were the decision makers. They were clean line in their thinking about what they wanted done. Uh, Harry Cohn would say, do it. Uh, I want her, I don't want him. It would be done that way. Now I think there are too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Dennis Opper was on the show, and, and he was also at, at uh, Warner Brothers uh, at the same time you were. Same time. And, and has since, of course, gone on to, to work in independent films, as, as, as you have. And he mentioned that, you know, the pros and cons of the system, that you, they, they did protect you, you did get the chance to do a lot of things and be around uh, people like uh, Bill Wellman and Raoul Walsh. Uh, Absolutely, and of course they could, they would use you a lot. For example, when Jimmy Dean was tied up on Giant and they needed somebody, or on, on East of Eden with Kazan, they needed someone to test with Carol Baker and George Stevens was doing the testing. Uh, they needed somebody to test with Carol Baker. I thought, my gosh, here's a great opportunity. I can work with a terrific director. Go ahead and do this. It'll be a wonderful chance to work with yet another person who you can learn something from. Uh, in those days, there were people like Natalie Wood at the studio, Paul Newman, uh, of course, Dennis, Mike Landon, uh, people like that. Clint Eastwood. Uh, Clint, of course. Well, and when you take a look at uh, Lafayette Escadrille, I stop to think of it, I think of the heavyweights that were in that. There was, you know, Clint, David Jansen, James Garner, Tom Laughlin, uh, just Will Hutchins. Uh, Will Hutchins. Uh, 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 Dennis Devine, Shelley McRae, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Bill Wellman Jr., yeah. and so forth. Now, uh, Tab, you were uh, born in New York uh, and raised in San Francisco? Yeah, in San Francisco and uh, Long Beach, California. Were you, as a kid, a uh, real moviegoer? Uh, yes, I movie was. Movie lover? What kind of pictures do you remember? Recall some of your favorites? <clears throat> well, I loved the action adventure. They were my favorite. The sort of, today's equivalent would be the Harrison Ford type mm -hmm. of, you know, of, uh, Raiders type yeah. film. I mean, I, I loved any of those action adventure things. Things like Bo Jest. Uh, Bo Jest is fabulous. Yeah. Lives of a Bengal Lancer, Gunga Din. Oh, all a Gunga Din, of course. Yeah. You're talking classic movie making. And what led you uh, into an acting career and getting into the movies? Well, my closest friend in the industry is a man by the name of Dick Clayton, and I've known Dick for years. Dick used to be an actor, then became an agent. He worked in the mailroom at the Fe Charlie Feldman's agency, then, you know, with all the top, top agents of Hollywood. He started people like Jane Fonda. He was Jimmy Dean's agent on the West Coast. He, you know, you just got Burt Reynolds. Uh, I, I just can't tell you all the people he has is, he is been agenting for for years, and then became personal manager for a lot of them. But Dick really started me in the business. When he was still an actor, I saw my first Broadway shows. Uh, I then went, he introduced me to, there was a man by the name of Paul Guilfoyle, who was a wonderful character yes. actor. Paul introduced me to a director, and that's how I got my, I did a couple of tests, and that's how I got the picture Island of Desire with Linda Darnell. Yeah, is that picture also known as Saturday's Children? Saturday Island in England. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And then um, Dick Clayton kept, he introduced me to Henry Wilson, who became my agent who started people like Rhonda Fleming, Rock Hudson, uh, Rory Calhoun. Uh, High-powered agent. I mean, uh, he was Wilson. a big agent. And then when Henry left, I stayed on with famous artists. And I got, it was all a whole different system then. The agents were extremely powerful individuals. Uh, and they had great connections with the studio. They would go there all the time. They wouldn't pick up the phone and do it all, and, you know, let's lunch. <laughs> and you had uh, a small, I guess your first official part in, in The Lawless, the Joseph Joe Losey picture? Joseph Losey, the first film, I said, hi, Fred, and went up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any interaction with Gail Russell on that picture? The thing about Gail Russell, I remember, she had just married Guy Madison. I think it was right about that time. And she seemed very frightened. She seemed very frail to me, and she was kind of very shy. And 
she had a problem. And uh, I just think she was basically a very insecure person. And uh, she was an absolute beautiful woman. I mean, those eyes that were penetrating. And a charming actress in this shape. She's I think she did a tragic. lot of Paramount, a lot of things yeah, there. Yeah, with Diana Diane. Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you say you were, of course, uh, all the, in all the, the press hype of the times, discovered by Warner Brothers? <laughs> <laughs> there are so many stories. Um, I would say it all happened through Dick Layton because I used to, I used to be a stable boy at the barn out. Dubrock's Riding Academy, and that's when I first met Dick. I was about 12 or 13 years old then. And Dick Layton was uh, an actor then, and he was the one who sort of planted the seed. But uh, between that and Paul Guilfoyle, uh, that's how I got my first role. And uh, would that be a situation where you'd actually meet Jack Warner uh, when you'd sign with a No, I'd never met Warner until much later when I was getting close to talking contract and all that. Um, it was all that the agents did most of that and now I think the nice thing about young people today is they can control their lives a little more than we did in my day. A lot of foolish mistakes were made you know back in the 50s and I'm sure earlier but nowadays the kids are the young people in the industry are pretty sharp. You did a terrific picture uh, called Track of the Cat with Bill Wellman at Warner's which is a really unique film in that he he and Bill Clothier, the uh, cinematographer, oh, went yeah. after shooting a black and white film in color. That's right. The only color in it was uh, Bob Mitchum's uh, red par uh, the parka, parka and Diana Lynn's uh, sort of yellow. Yeah, it's a yellow scarf or something. Yellow blouse. Now, of course, Wellman is uh, known as Wild Bill Wellman. Did you find him to be uh, to earning his nickname? Or? I had a great uh, when I did Lafayette Escadrille. I had a wonderful relationship with Bill. I really, really liked him a lot. He was terrific. I'll never forget a wonderful story. Is one the first time <clears throat> they didn't want craft services on the uh, on the set, they decided to. Jack Warner had this huge coffee machine brought in where you have to put a dime in. And Billman said, Bill Wellman said, "What the hell is this?" And he said, "Open up those soundstage doors." Boom! They opened up. He took it and he took the coffee and he rolled it down the thing and threw it out in the middle of the street. <laughs> And I'll be damned if any of my crew or cast are going to have to pay for coffee. <laughs> Needless to say, from then on, coffee was being brewed on the set all day long. <laughs> he was a great guy. We got in a little bit of a, not hassle, but he was upset with me when I turned down a picture of his. Uh, Darby's Rangers? Darby's yeah. Rangers. Uh, I had been working really hard, and I wanted a trip to Europe, and uh, I wanted this vacation. And Bill Woman called me that night. I was leaving in the morning. And he said, God bless you, Buffalo Bill. That's what he used to say to everybody. He said, God bless you, Buffalo Bill. And I said, oh, hi, Bill. And I knew something about the picture. And he said, well, we start next week. And I said, Bill, I'm going to Europe. At which point he said, you dirty so-and-so of our pads never cross again. And I thought, oh, God, well, Mitch has hung up the phone on me. What am I going to do? I called my agent. He said, to hell with him. Go to Europe and have a great time. And then when I was in Europe, I kept getting calls from Jack Warner and all these different people saying, Bill Wellman, we've got to do a new ending to the picture with Bill. And I said, I can't work with him again. He said, if our pads ever cross again, I'm scared to death to go to work for him again. He said, uh, I said, look, I'll come back and do a new ending of the picture, providing he doesn't make me nervous about working with him. I mean, I gotta, you know, you got to have good condi working yeah. conditions. And I really liked Bill. He was a great guy. So I came back and said he looked at me with that jaundiced eye and I thought, uh oh And he threw his arms around me and I felt much better when he did a new ending for the picture and business was business. He was a terrific man. Yeah. Plus he had some beautiful daughters. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sissy and Maggie. Kitty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was funny because, it, of course, that was the picture that, that uh, Wellman's last release picture, although I know he did Darby's Rangers afterward, but the studio held up the release oh, really? uh, because of the fact that the, the initial tragic ending to the story, and of course it was a very personal kind of story for Wellman, the story of Lafayette Escadrille, and he had been in the Lafayette Flying Corps. That's true. That was uh, the, the true ending is the character I played was killed, yeah. and the girl committed suicide, and the audience, when they put it out, wouldn't accept that, so we had to come and do a new ending. And uh, they went through title chains like C'est la guerre and la guerre, uh, with that's you right. in my arms it was called at one well, point. I didn't know that. No. Yeah, you kind of inter intermediate title. That girl was marvelous. Yeah, now she was an interesting actress, a Chica Chirou. A Chica Chirou. Yeah. In, in terms of, uh, there was a real camaraderie among the young flyers on that film. And I guess the, much of that must have generated from Wellman. Well, he knew it, knew it well. He lived it. 
and he tried to instill that camaraderie with our uh, with our whole cast. Again, I'm talking uh, family unit. Bill created family. He built his family when he did a picture, and that's the way it should be. It like makes for good work. Working with guys probably in the crew that he worked with for 40 years, and uh, Bill Jr. Uh, playing Bill himself. Playing his father, yes. Now you really kind of went through the the, the, the grinder on that picture. You, uh, you you get slapped by your father. You get slapped by the drill instructor. You're <laughs> thrown in jail. There's a terrific fight scene, if you recall, where you're scarred. Oh, yes. Um, and that was all shot on the sound stage. Very, very effective, very evocative kind of kind of feeling. Well, Bill Clothier was a ter just a tremendous director of photography. He was really good. And Wellman and, and, and Clothier worked very well together. Very well together. It was a nice, uh, what I would call it by today's standards, just a little picture, but it had a good look, yeah. a good feel to it. On, on something like Lafayette Escadrille or uh, Track of the Cat, was there much rehearsal time or was it, what kind of a director, was he more of just get in there and do it? And no, Bill did allow you the freedom to get out there and uh, I think rehearsals are wonderful. I like that. I think you get a chance to really get comfortable in what you're doing there. I think that's important for an actor to be to the point of where you can really be creative. Everyone works differently and I work where I must be comfortable in the scene where I really work my, uh, my, I can do my best work. Uh, Bill allowed you that. Yeah, working on working on track of the cat, for example, with, with Robert Mitchum, uh, the two very I guess two very powerful personalities in Mitchum <laughs> and Wellman. Yeah. Well, that was <coughs> Mitchum is just a he's a he's an oh he's an entity unto himself. I mean, he's a great guy. He would come on the set and say, uh, "What picture are we shooting today?" <laughs> 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 it would just that would just totally destroy me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I just wasn't used to that. I loved him. He was great because yeah. he's so easy. <laughs> I mean, he's, he really is a lovely. Love it. And uh, Abula Bondi was also in that picture. Yeah, a Beulah wonderful was. actress. And I got to know Abula quite well after that. And I used to go up and visit her at her home. On Whitley yes. Terrace? On Whitley there? Terrace, yeah, yeah. absolutely. She told me that uh, one of her first scenes working with Wellman in that picture, he was using some objectionable language. And she finally went over and said, Mr. Wellman, I'm, I can't work if you're going to be using these kinds of words. And Wellman apologized and uh, changed his, uh, his demeanor. Oh, yeah. Wellman was a, I mean, was a very flexible person in many ways, too. I mean, he had, he, as a director, he was very tough and knew what he wanted. But uh, he was that old salt school, you know. And Beulah was a marvelous lady. And I think you have to work accordingly with the people that are around you. If some people like to work from a more gut level and more earthy level, you relate to that. And if somebody works on a more of a head level in a more genteel way, you relate to that if you're a director. You do whatever you can to get the best you possibly can out of them. And Bill was smart enough to know that, and Beulah was fabulous. And uh, now, again, getting back to Lafayette Escadrille, it's, a, it's an interesting because it's a, still a very popular picture. It's, really? it's playing on cable. Uh, all the time, at uh, a lot of the kind of you know, uh, TBS for example shows it quite a bit. And all before residuals. <laughs> <laughs> in the days of the contract. Uh, uh, did Did Bill actually put you up in the air at all? I know he used some stock footage on some of the dog fights, no. but did you ever have to go up in the no, in those, in those old machines? No, we had uh, we had a wonderful man. I forget his name right now. Who Frank Clark, uh, Paul Mance, or Frank. Paul Clark. Mance. Yeah. Paul Manson, was that it? Paul, Paul Mads. Mads. Paul Mads. Yeah, yeah. He did all of those, you know, flying those stop with camels and uh, uh, whatever the other planes were, but the stunt work was excellent. Uh, in terms of uh, working with some of these real veteran film directors, some of the guys who, who made the pictures that you used to love as a kid, uh, someone like Raoul Walsh, I guess he was also from that school. Raoul was an interesting man. Uh, <clears throat> I was crazy about Raoul as a person. But he never, you never really thought of him as a director. You know, he was just an old blood and guts Raoul. I mean, <laughs> Raoul would sit there and roll his cigarette and look and roll this thing and with a patch over the eye and say, all right, let's go, let's roll him. And he'd turn his back and he'd be walking around. I think, is he, is he aware of what's happening in front of the camera? I mean, what's happening here? Or his direction would be things like, I had a scene on the telephone where I had to call my wife, I mean, my girlfriend, and tell her that I was being honest, you know, that I loved her and all of that, but yet I was having a relationship with this married woman. So I'm just getting, uh, taking a preparation for the scene, and Raul says to me, right in the middle of the take, he says, all right, sit back, hang up the phone, and think of the old broad. <laughs> well, I said, Raul, can we, give, me a, give me my space here, will you? Let me do, you know, just totally destroy your concentration. But, but he was a great action director. 
Yeah. Great action, but when it came to the, yeah. the love scenes and things, like, I got a little bored with that. He wanted to get those things moving. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, uh, Lee, both Lee Marvin and Anne Francis have told us stories exactly Anne the same. was fabulous. <laughs> She's a wonderful yeah, girl. I yeah. liked her. I and wish I'd had more to do with her in that yeah. film. Yeah. You know, if, it's a, if it's a tender scene, it, well, she was, okay, you do that, then you do that, you do that, and then you go smoke a cigarette, <laughs> and then for the action stuff, it'd be, okay, now the horses come down, and then you're... Oh, yeah, <laughs> you drop now in the fight, you pick the guy up by his feet, and you just crash him right through the jukebox. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Where's the stunt man? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, John Wayne, you worked with, uh, I guess, but he produ actually produced uh, Track of the Cat. That you uh, yeah, in. but I actually I only worked with him in one film, and that was a Sea Chase. Was that also Wanda. a bad track? Uh, a sea Chase? I think the Sea Chase worse. was. It was John Farrow. He was a tough John guy. John Wayne, Lana Turner. Yeah, Farrow yeah. was a tough guy. Uh, from not exactly an actor's director. From, from no, I wasn't. I, I, I thought he was. I love his wife. Yeah, yeah. Uh, working with Lana Turner, uh, she again a real glamour star. Was there that kind of thing where you know waiting for the, waiting for her makeup or, or well, there like was that waiting, nature? but I'll tell you she was right. She was right to want to wait in a couple. She had her reasons and she was justified in them. Uh, and I'll tell you that another time. That's another, <laughs> another story. My favorite story about Lana is the first night she arrived in Hawaii. I was so crazy about her. I thought, oh my God, I remember. Lana Turner, you know, post on her twice, and they used to go on and on. So, we used to stay at a little house down the beach, and these Hawaiian girls would string these flower lays for us. So I came over to her and I said, I want to give you your first lay in Hawaii. You know, <laughs> put it around her neck, you know, and she smiled. She was really nice. And the next day, the first time I was introduced to her was on, on the set. And she was sitting there, and I just, I couldn't take my eyes off her. I said, you know... <laughs> I said, you know, I've been a I've been a fan of yours since I was a kid, <laughs> <laughs> which was just. <laughs> I have a great habit of putting my foot right in my mouth. <laughs> Not the thing to say to Lana. No, uh, but John, she was really very nice. And John Wayne was he everything that that we would get from the screen? Uh, in real I life? I only had a few dealings with him in a couple of scenes, and I didn't find him the most compassionate person. Hopper told us that uh, when they did True Grit together, uh, Wayne used to come on the set with his 45s and say, where's that commie Hopper? And uh, there's definitely a diff different generational thing. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. Generational thing. My favorite story is with Geraldine Page. You know, we compared a couple of John Wayne stories together. She My was in Hondo with Farrow. She yeah. was in, in Hondo with, with Wayne. <clears throat> and he was not happy with her. So he'd stand there and he'd say, well, say something. And the camera would be on him again. And she said, I'm waiting for you to tell me what to say. In other words, give me a little something, will you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was dynamite. That was a fantastic lady. Of course, uh, you were nominated for an Emmy uh, in a picture, uh, a Playhouse 90, Portrait of a Murderer with Geraldine Page. Yeah, that was a good show, and she was, she was incredible to watch, to work, to watch her, her. This instrument, this instrument of hers was like a sponge. It could just do anything. And I'll never forget a scene. She came in with the groceries, and the police had just told her that I'd been that they'd caught me and that I was the one who committed these burglaries and these murders. And she came in with these bags full of groceries and she walked across the room and she sat down in a chair. And she got up from the chair and she started to walk across the room and all of a sudden she fell on the floor and got the milk and the bread and the thing. all. And we were doing a rehearsal and she finished it and I said, they said, cut. And I said, God, Jerry, that was beautiful. And she said, yeah. You know, she, just, I mean, she could get in and out. She was so quick to get in and out of her emotions where she could just like... I mean, they just flowed so freely. She was a she was a lovely person too, just lovely. Well, who directed uh, that that episode? Do you recall? I uh, think that was Arthur Penn. Ah, it was in live television. Uh, it was either Frankenheimer or Penn for that one. I think yeah. that would no, that was uh, that was definitely Arthur Penn. And he's also a very giving director. Very well. Those cool directors director. all came out of you know the directors that d went on to do these great motion pictures came out of live television and. Like John Frankenheimer was an assistant of Sidney Lumet's. Now we're talking, you know, you know what your shots are. You're not going to have to rely on some editor to ruin your picture. And, and you know how to work with actors. I mean, they all came out of the, uh, the out of the, the theater, the Strasbourg, majority. Yeah. That's why it was such a thrill to work with those those wonderful actors from New York. It's interesting because that was, of course, you were really cast against type in that show, as you were in a later film, which is really a, 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 a kind of an unsung kind of a gem. It is out on video. Uh, Called Sweet Kill, or also known as The Arousers, in which you played a psychopathic killer, and that's a dynamite picture. The picture, Tamara Asayev is a bright young lady. She did Norma Ray, and she's a good yeah. producer. Yeah. She's a good producer. She had a really good idea with this picture, and it 
was a nice little film. But then what happened is Roger Corman got along and decided to turn it into try to make a little more, you know, tits and ass and this kind of thing. Real exploitation. It just wasn't the picture. So I happened to see it finally, and I was appalled because I think the film really could have had a little interesting, but it, it just took a swing in the wrong direction. I blame that on distribution and what they wanted yeah, to make, yeah, what they yeah. thought they could sell. But that really wasn't the picture that they started out to make. It was a pretty scary oh. film. Because your performance is very, very powerful in that film. I mean, it's, well, it's again, it's a against type kind of a thing. It, thank you. That was it was, a, it was the, the character. You know, you're only as good as that written page, and if you've got something there that unlock something inside of you that you can push that trigger on and give vent to. That's very important. Well, when you were at Warner's, did you ever have any input into the material, or was it pretty much, this is what you're going to do? No, and this no. Is, Basically, uh, I turned down quite a few things there and got a few suspensions. Mm -hmm. ah, you <laughs> was following in, a, in an honorable tradition of Jimmy Cagney and Olivia de Havilland. Betty, Betty Davis. Davis. <laughs> Absolutely. Jack Davis and I talked about that a few times. <laughs> she was she's a pistol. Um,